Hey, how you doing everyone? Femi Temo here. And I'm joined by yet another incredible musician. This is my brother from another mother. <laughs> and he's a drummer, he's a piano player, he's a, a composer, he's a producer. His name is Troy Miller. And pff, man, if there's anyone that I want to be like when I grow up, it's like this guy, Troy, what's going on? You say that to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I, well, actually, not everyone. Just the people that I don't like. Okay, well, that, that's reassuring. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so you know, obviously we've known each other for a long time. We've mm. grown up together musically, as it were. Um, but it would be nice for other people to get to know you as a musician, as a, you know, as a person. Um, why don't you let's let's talk about you know kind of where you came from musically? Because I know that you know you come from kind of uh, uh, you're, well, you're English. For starters, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you, you, you grew up in a, uh, a household where music wasn't necessarily like a staple, was it? You know, no, up. but I mean, my parents liked music, but it was very, you know, we had lots of different kinds of music on in the house. We, we had a lot of classical music mm. um, and a lot of kind of folk music, you know, Bob Dylan. Yeah. Everything ranging from Bruce Springsteen, Dire Straits to Elgar, wow. you know, yeah. and, and Beethoven. Yeah, and so it was really an eclectic mix for me, mm. and you know, um, on top of that, I was I was sort of playing in church um, from a very early age, yeah. um, piano and drums and violin, oh, and and all sorts. <laughs> so, you know, um, I have very sort of eclectic tastes, tastes and, and really. influences. I mean, the jazz thing sort of came later mm. in a way. How much later? Well, probably when I was a teenager. Okay. Um, my first introduction to jazz really was uh, through Elvin Jones. Mm. I went to see him one time with his uh, jazz machine. Mm. And at first I really didn't get it, you know, I, I, I was sort of slightly in awe but slightly confused at sure. the same time. Um, story. I needed a, another reference if sure. you like. And um, you know, I was checking out Tony Williams at the same time, you know, uh, when you used to play with Miles in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And I needed something to sort of bridge the gap. Mm. And for me, um, there were two drummers that stood out for me, Ralph Peterson mm. um, and Jeff Tame Watts. Right. And both of them are sort of my mentors now. And um, they somehow made the music more accessible for me. Amazing, yeah. yeah. You know, having obviously the influences of classical music, of pop music, rock music, folk music growing up, but not jazz, mm. you know. Um, how long would you say before you were able to kind of reconnect the dots? Because, you know, as you know, when you get into jazz, you kind of have to make it your focus for a while. Yes. And you have to be all about it, yeah. you know. How long and, and what kind of processes helped you to shape kind of connecting the dots so that jazz became just another part of your musical identity rather than the only part. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the connecting of the dots is still happening it's now right. and it's sure. a continual process. Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's just happened over time and through listening and through studying and mm. through transcribing. Mm. But also, I'm sort of a firm believer of you're kind of a product of the music and the gigs that you play. Absolutely. You know, so if, for me, it was, it was being forced onto the bandstand, mm. sort of almost <laughs> against my will, and I couldn't really play, but I was amongst musicians who really could play. Right. And sort of pushed me in a certain direction. Right. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sort of a firm believer of learning on the bandstand, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and for it to be experiential. Yeah, absolutely. As opposed to just, Thinking here, about it yeah. all, right, all the time, yeah. So, you know, it's a proce process of time, really. Mm. Mm. What was your first drum kit? Do you remember what colour it was, how it sounded, what it felt like to play? What right. make was it? You know what, I didn't care what my first drum kit Actually, <laughs> my first drum kit was a set of cardboard boxes <laughs> and saucepans. <laughs> wow. Seriously, and that, that was my very first drum kit. And, you know, I, I was so enthusiastic about hitting things that it didn't it honestly <laughs> didn't matter wow um, but then my brother actually bought a, a, a beat up old premier mm. kit mm. Um, that I played on for years and I still have it really and um, wow. I'm not particularly interested in in what I play it's, it's more about you yeah. know what you do with it obviously but 
but Yamaha have been really good to me. You know, they've uh, endorsed me and mm. Sabian symbols now, so uh, they, they've been very supportive. Mm. Um, and they're, they're great sounding drums. Right. So. Did they approach you? I mean, how did that how did that happen, or did you approach them? How did that relationship? Form? Well, a bit of both, really. I mean, I like I always liked Yamaha drums, and. Uh, I think a friend of mine sort of put me onto them, mm. uh, made a call on my behalf, so mm. to speak. Yeah. And um, at the time, I wasn't really doing sort of many high-profile gigs, yeah. but they still sort of took me on. Mm. And um, you know, since then, I've sort of done up, up the ante, yeah, <laughs> as it were. Yeah, you know, started to play with people like Roy Ayers and, mm. and Macy Gray and. and uh, Amy Winehouse and Mark Ronson, sure. those guys, yeah. and they're very supportive even if you're doing very little yeah. gigs, yeah. you know, they've sort of, um, I feel like they're endorsing me and not, mm. not who I sure. play with. So. Exactly, absolutely, yeah. You mentioned about playing with Amy Winehouse. When did you start playing with her and how did that come about? I mean, how was that whole experience for you? Because you played with her um, pretty much about the last five years, some, right. something like, nearly right. five years. Right. A drum. Bring it up. Rap, rap. Church fearing man. Can you best fear him? Troy Miller. Well, the first time um, I got the call from it, MD Dale Davis called me, and I couldn't, I wasn't available to do the gig. I think I was playing in Poland with Don Blackman or someone. Right. And, um, you know, so I, I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I couldn't do it on this occasion. Mm -hmm. And he called me back, you know, um, for the next tour, and ended up sort of doing that. And when I met Amy, um, it was just before she'd won the Grammys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her career had just sort of taken, taken off, taken off mm. you know, and her, her personal life had just sort of taken a turn for the worse mm. as well. But um, when I first met her, she said, oh, you're, you're, you, um, you're Troy Miller, you, uh, you played on Soweto Kinch's album. Mm, that's right. Because she was a big fan of Soweto's, that's you know, right. mm. as you know, because we both, sure, we sure. both played with Soweto. Sure, and sure. Um, she said, you've got an album out too, haven't you? 40 <laughs> Days. I was like, quite surprised. I was surprised, yeah, you know. <laughs> I said, yeah, I bought that the other day. Wow. You know, because I wasn't sure about doing the gig, to be honest, mm. in the first place. But the fact that she'd, you know, taken the care to, 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 to check me out as a musician right. and, a, yeah. and a writer as well, I felt a certain amount of loyalty and, and kinship, in a way, mm, mm, with mm. her for that reason. And, mm. and that's the reason I sort of stuck with her mm. until the end, really. What the public didn't see, you know, in the rehearsals, where we'd hear her sing sort of world class, and then we'd go and do the gig, you know, and she'd had something to drink, and it would all, um, you know, it would all be lost, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was really shattering and really saddening. Yeah. Well, good selling albums in in. I mean, I know for one, for sure in Poland with an artist called Mika. Or Baniak, it went platinum. How have you found making the transition from musician to producer? I mean, you know, for me, I know that it, it's always within, but until it actually happens, you know, the transition is something that you long for. When it happens, yes. how have you found it in reality, mm. going from a drummer to a drummer who is also a producer, like mm. a really successful one? Well, you know, in one respect, um, it's, it's sort of a very different animal. Mm. You know, when, when I first got asked to produce an artist, all I had was my laptop, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I had to, you know, it, it, this particular artist was signed to a major label, mm. 
and I wasn't very well equipped, but of, you know, of course, I want it was something I wanted to do. Sure. So I, you know, set about, I suppose, learning some of the more technical aspects and, and building up a gear and a sense of how to produce. Mm -hmm. um, but on another level, you know, it's like it's almost just a natural extension of being a musician. Sure, sure. You know, you're you're. I suppose you're thinking more like an arranger or a compo composer would mm, mm. Um, and you're, you're trying to think of the bigger picture and not just about you know what you do as a musician sure sure, um, sure. In your particular field mm. and that I found that sort of helped my musicianship as well mm. and vice versa you mm. know yeah so again it's been a process and I'm still learning so yeah. always we're always so, learning yeah. it's a lifetime's lifetime's work